Welcome to Kevin Deal Photography, where I take you along my journey through photography. On today's episode, I'm going to provide you with five tips to help you along in your journey as an up-and-coming portrait photographer. These are non-technical tips. These are not camera settings. These are just things that you can do before, during, and after your session to improve your experience for both you and your clients. Clients will go out of their way to tell everyone not to work with you if you do a poor job. It's much more difficult to get clients to go out and tell everyone to work with you. You gotta put in more work. You have to not only be good at taking pictures, but you have to be good at other aspects of your job. Unfortunately, photography is not just taking great pictures. I can't tell you how many photographers I've run across in my life who are amazing at what they do, but they're terrible with people. So let's dive into the five tips I'm gonna share with you to become a better portrait photographer and stick around to the end as I'm gonna share a bonus tip. Tip number one, put together a mood board. If you just grab your 24 to 70, go out into a field, take a client out there, take their picture and hope for the best, you're really not doing them or yourselves any favors. You're not working to your potential. You went in there without a plan. So how can you expect to do your best work? Putting together a mood board proves to the client that you're as mutually invested in the outcome of this project as they are. It shows that you show up to work prepared. It shows that you care about how things turn out. What is a mood board? A mood board shows planning. It shows that you're, you're putting thought into the place, the time of day, the lighting, the wardrobe, all these really important things that make for better pictures. So examples of mood boards. I know most of you watching this have at least heard of Pinterest. Pinterest is a great place to start with mood boards. I don't think it's the best place, but it's definitely a great place to start. It's a place where you can take all your ideas, put them together, and kind of view them to create an aesthetic. Now, if you want to take it a step further, I recommend going with something like Canva, which is a great free website where you can use templates to create mood boards. I use Canva, which by the way, I'm not endorsed by them in any way, shape or form, but I do use Canva uh, to uh, put together mood boards to show the type of lighting I want, the type of setting that I want, the location. Uh, the client will usually throw some shots of their uh, wardrobe in there. And I can take all these different parts of the project and put them together in one spot that helps me create my master aesthetic for how I want this to turn out. The other great thing about Canva is you can invite the clients to collaborate and they can drag and drop their images in. You can drag and drop your images in. On more complex projects, I use it with hair and makeup artists and other, other people who are part of a larger project where we can all collaborate. Another note, if you shoot other styles of photography that require you to be on location, so for instance, I shoot street photography, while you're out there doing that, pay attention to your surroundings. Oftentimes I find myself in a particular place and even at a particular time of year where the sun hits a certain way and I make a note and I go, man, I'd love to take a client out here. Take note of these situations and use them to your advantage. These very locations often end up on future mood boards. Step number two, make sure that the client does their homework. And by doing their homework, I mean they go through your portfolio and they pick out their favorite five, maybe 10 shots. Ask them to pick out their favorite shots of your work that shows how they want you to shoot them on this project, okay? This is not to stroke your ego, this is to do a bunch of homework for you. So like for instance, it provides insight. So a lot of times I'll be like, hey, pick your favorite five shots that I've taken that you're like, oh yeah, this is how I want him to shoot me on this project. A lot of times they'll pick five shots I took with an 85 millimeter at f1.2. A lot of times they'll pick five shots I took at golden hour. A lot of times they'll pick five shots that I took in a studio with a white backdrop. It provides all this insight for how I need to execute my shoot. It also makes sure that at the end of the shoot that the client isn't gonna go, oh, well, I wanted you to do this or that. You put them on the spot ahead of time and said, hey, choose five shots that kind of represent how you want me to shoot you. And then at the tail end, if they see a bunch of shots at 85 millimeters, 1.2, they're not gonna be like, oh, I don't like blurry backgrounds. No, they chose the blurry backgrounds. That's exactly what they wanted. So. Work smarter, not harder. This isn't to stroke your ego. This is to just help you narrow down what equipment you're gonna use, what kind of apertures you're gonna use, what kind of lighting you're gonna use, where you're gonna shoot, all those things. This helps you and it's going to end up giving your client better results. 
Another reason why I do this discovery process where I let clients go through my portfolio is oftentimes they are recommended to me, but I'm not necessarily the best fit for them. So they'll go through my portfolio, conclude that maybe I'm not the photographer that they thought I was and that I wasn't a good fit for them. And that's okay. You should befriend other photographers and then recommend those photographers to this client because you're still the good guy. It's okay to turn down business if you know it's going to end in a disaster. Step number three, take less pictures. There's no reason to take the same picture five times. If you know you nailed it, you nailed it. Maybe take a second to be sure. You know, if you shoot weddings, okay, I can understand you shooting in like burst mode during the first kiss and all that. You don't want to miss a really crucial moment. But if you're going and taking someone out into a field, you're shooting in a studio, you know you nailed the shot. Why do you take the same shot seven times? You know, I know pixels are free, but time is money. Don't feel the pressure to take more images. Feel the pressure to take better images. How much time do you want to spend culling and looking at the same exact photos and hitting delete? You know, if you have to spend 10 seconds looking at each photo and you take a thousand shots, that's a lot of seconds right there, isn't it? So make sure you just don't take a lot of shots to begin with. Trust your instincts and work with that. Step number four, learn to cull your images properly. If you take a thousand shots during a portrait session and you just upload them somewhere and let the client choose the shots, I got very, very bad news for you. Clients suck at picking pictures, so give them less bad pictures to choose from. Also, keep in mind, people will judge you based off your worst picture. So if a client chooses a picture that makes you cringe, then the client makes you edit that picture, and then you put that really cringe-worthy picture on, on Instagram, or they put that cringe-worthy picture on Instagram, that is an advertisement for your services. People are going to judge you and go, I'm not hiring that photographer. They take bad pictures. Don't give the client the bad picture to begin with. I usually cull at least half of my images down. So if I take 500 shots during a session, the client's not getting more than 250 shots. Even if you're a wedding photographer and you take like 2,500 pictures or 1,000 pictures or whatever, at the end of the day, your client probably doesn't want more than 500 of the best or 250 of the best. Decide on a number and stick with it and chop it down a lot because clients are not going to make good decisions. I've actually given clients pictures where I've missed focus and didn't realize it, and they've picked them. Clients don't see things that we see, and then I go in after the fact, I'm like, well, I have to delete that picture because I missed focus. You shouldn't give a client a picture where you miss focus. You should just give them your best work, and then let them choose from your best work, and then your best work will be out there in the world, people will see it, and then they will only judge you on your best work. One thing that I absolutely want to clarify is when I said you give your client 500 to 250 pictures, I'm talking about wedding clients. If you go do a regular portrait session, I hope you're not giving them 250, 300 pictures. You know, maybe give them 30 and then have them choose from that and then choose the whatever the predetermined number is you decided to edit, whether it's five or 10 or whatever. Uh, that's between you and the client. Okay, step number five. I know we like to turn around things really fast for clients, and I used to do that in the beginning, but I've come to learn over time that you do need to take a slight break from your work, look at it with a fresh set of eyes, because you will typically do better jobs of editing. Oftentimes you have emotional attachments to a, an image that you worked really hard to get, but at the end of the day, the image, it just sucked. You know, you have to be honest with yourself. Sometimes you put no effort into an image and it was spontaneous and it ended up being a portfolio shot. You just have to be honest with yourself. And sometimes time is the factor that you need in order to be honest with yourself and make those decisions. Don't feel the pressure to turn everything around. Just make sure that you are under promising and over delivering with clients. If you are a week behind, Tell them that it's gonna take two weeks to turn around their edits. If you're a booked photographer, you're a busy photographer. There's no reason you should be able to turn things around in 24 hours if you're always booked. Me personally, I've found that I need to be in the proper headspace to edit right, and if I'm not in the proper headspace to do an edit for a client, am I doing the best for my clients? I hope those tips were helpful. I'm gonna go ahead and give you my bonus tip, which is if you shoot in the studio, shoot tethered. There's a lot of reasons for shooting tethered. One, the client can see themselves in real time. It builds confidence. They can see that the session is going well, and then they give you a better performance. A lot of supermodels back in the day would have a mirror off to the side so they could see themselves. I work with a lot of professional models. They love the fact that I shoot tethered. They can quickly adapt. They can see what they look like and then slightly change their pose. Also, let's just be honest, from etiquette standpoint, you should never touch a model. Being able to shoot tethered allows you to walk over to a screen, point to them and go, well, you should have lifted your hand up about two inches this way or whatever, or it'd be better if you lifted your hand up two inches this way or whatever. You never have to touch a model. Um, you can just point at the screen. 
Another big advantage of tethering is that you don't have to keep showing the back of your camera to your client, which disrupts the workflow of a session. They can see everything in real time at light speed. The session can keep going on and you can save valuable time. So I hope those tips were helpful. I hope this uh, video was helpful. I hope it helps you grow as a portrait photographer. If you like what you saw, please click the like and subscribe button below. I really do appreciate your support. I'm gonna hopefully roll out these tips every week, two weeks at max. I wanna help all you beginning photographers grow. So thanks for checking out my video. Bye.